welcome everybody to the Dynamic Systems and Controls Division podcast in ASME. Today we have an um, awesome guest with us, Professor Kamal Youssef Tuomi. Um, he's a professor of mechanical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. He is co-director of the Center for Complex Engineering Systems at King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia and MIT, director of the Im Khaldun Fellowship Program for Saudi Arabian Women and director of the MIT Mechatronic Research Laboratory. He earned his master's and um, doctor of science degrees from MIT. Yusuf Tomis research has focused primarily on modeling, design, control theory, systems intelligence, and their applications to dynamic systems. In particular, he explores the development of control and learning techniques with fast adaptation. Applications have include robotics, automation, intelligent systems with artificial intelligence, metrology, and nanoscale video imaging. He made significant contributions to MIT's international research and education collaborations including Qatar, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates. Youssef Tommy is the recipient of the National Science Foundation Presidential Young Investigator Award from President Ronald Reagan. He served on many professional committees uh, and as a consultant for several multinationals. He is an IEEE senior member and life member an ASME fellow and a fellow of the International Association of Advanced Materials. He served as editor of several symposia conference proceedings. He authored over 350 publications and holds about 50 registered pending patents. Professor, Professor uh, Yusef Tomi has been an invited lecturer at over 260 seminars at companies, research centers, and universities throughout the world. So it is an honor to have you here. Welcome, Kamal. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I appreciate it uh, for you and the team to having me with you. Great. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited about this. So let's let's kick, uh, kick start this um, with the first question. So I would like you to walk us through your research process and throughout all of this year and throughout your career, how do you stay motivated when working in long, long-term projects? Motivation. Yeah, Brian, uh, motivation um, plays an important role, of course, in the success of uh, uh, like any uh, uh, projects, particularly as you mentioned in your question about uh, uh, projects that are, you know, uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, projects. Uh, and also if they are you know complex. Uh, in my case, I have two uh, primary elements uh, uh, that I'd like to mention. So the first one is uh, uh, the actions that I take. And the second one is the, the environment that I operate in. Um, and so um, the, uh, uh, the actions are things that are under my control. And so one of them is, uh, you know, the nature of the projects that I engage in. Of course, you know, we choose the uh, projects that have relevance, challenging research questions, uh, and that helps actually making pieces, you know, fall into place. Uh, also, I think in, in projects like this, you know, the opportunity, you know, to contribute something new, something original, you know, in the field, you know, be it uh, theory, um, uh, a new approach or methodology, uh, uh, even maybe experimental uh, findings, you know, those also keep me, you know, motivated. Um, so uh, uh, in the end, you know, such uh, projects, you know, uh, help me maintain uh, or generate passion, you know, for these uh, uh, answers that I'm trying to, uh, to find, especially for these long-term projects. Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, uh, I have, in fact, you know, turned down some projects with funding in the past, you know, that uh, in my view at that time, you know, did not have the right uh, uh, content, you know, for uh, 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 
you know, for research and, and development. Um, and of course, stay, stay, uh, staying up to date, you know, with the literature, the technology, you know, a person gets more, you know, inspired by that and getting maybe new ideas and approaches. And 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 the staying up to date, uh, Brian, is not just, you know, in our field. Uh, in my case, I look at others, uh, even, you know, uh, things that have nothing to do with my work, because sometimes, you know, different uh, ideas from different fields, you know, can help uh, um, uh, a person in in staying like motivated. Um, uh, the other thing is like, you know, uh, how to build, you know, the uh, teams as part of the research uh, project, you know, so that we can have uh, like highly uh, skilled individuals and so on. In my, uh, for, uh, 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 from my point of view, my drive is uh, is winning and winning in terms of uh, finding a novel solution and uh, in my lab, I use the phrase uh, like taking the perpendicular. OK, you can see people all going in the same direction and you try to go like in, in a direction that is perpendicular uh, to that. Um, the, the other thing is about, uh, you know, the uh, the environment that we operate in, you know, uh, you know, having people that are supportive, you know, plays an important uh, role. I'm very feel very fortunate, you know, to be in such a department at uh, MIT, having great students, great researchers, great colleagues, and also world experts, you know, in their field that are, you know, just a few steps away or maybe uh, a phone call away. And of course, the administrative support, you know, plays an important role because, you know, can uh, sometimes if it's not at the acceptable level, you know, from the administration, you know, can cause perhaps some kind of uh, uh, challenges. Um, so, uh, and of course, working with you know uh, other other people, you know, either in uh, projects, uh, uh, companies, for example, that are at the forefront of uh, of technology, uh, large centers, for example, I uh, directed the or co-directed a couple of centers centers like in the clean water, clean energy area, complex engineering systems. And so, uh, so these are, I think, the uh, you know some of the things that, uh, uh, at least for me, you know, keep a person like uh, motivated and excited, uh, you know, uh, 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 like every day, uh, right? And of course, environments that have uh, great facilities and and allow you to operate like in an independent way and to make your own decisions and and then you know own your uh, resources in, in managing them. Yeah, so these are, I think, some of the uh, things. Uh, sorry that I maybe spoke a little bit fast about uh, this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, you're touching very, very important points. I think if I could tell my younger self precisely that motivation is not, on, not only, like I'm motivated because I care about the problem, but I'm motivated because other people are working on other tough problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. I always, I always look, like to look at different areas like aerospace. I would always would have liked to jump into aerospace because I think it's so cool what they're doing, but that type of things motivate me. And then now that I'm more grounded in the research world, I, I totally appreciate how having a solid floor, so solid administrative support yes, yeah. and support of your colleagues and your team is the only way really to take off and to really yeah. do impactful yeah. research. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree, Brian. And especially, you know, if one is dealing with uh, complex uh, projects, uh, multidisciplinary projects, you know, uh, we need that kind of uh, uh, kind of support, you know, to uh, uh, to um, uh, do the progress and, and the person maintains like uh, sanity while they are you know, working on these uh, on these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other word is multidisciplinary. It's just it's so common right now. I think that is nothing worth doing is really focused on one object. It's always multidisciplinary. You always need to tackle it from different angles, different perspectives, different sciences. It's it's amazing how it's exactly. Evolving. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 also, you know, uh, in an environment where on one hand, especially like in the academic environment that we have, you know, we can take uh, risks and uh, and experiment with things, you know, and uh, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, having the 
facilities, you know, to uh, to do that. For example, for uh, designing and making prototypes very quickly, to refine the ideas, to um, um, check those um, ideas, you know, very quickly, and then to, you know to move on. Uh, I think all of all of these pieces, in my mind, I think they uh, play like an important role to have like a lab or a center or so you know, where you have different people working so that they can be like a very produ productive and having people working at their, you know, the, the maximum capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great points that you bring up. So um, let's let's move on. Um, I have been very curious about asking you about the term industry 4.0 that has been it has been around for less than a decade. But it's already uh, it's already having a major impact on automation in various industries. So, uh, what are some of the most exciting developments you've seen in this field, and how do you see control engineers play, playing a role in its continued growth? Okay. Yeah. So uh, yes. Uh, so the uh, this uh, industry 4.0 the fourth industrial revolution, digital transformation, you know, are, I think, important uh, uh, phrases. Um, the, as you just said, you know, this uh, digital uh, transformation, you know, has been around, you know, for uh, some time. And a lot of companies, you know, have used, uh, used them to modernize, you know, their operations. Um, sometimes they maybe refer to it as smart manufacturing or the IIoT, um, maybe industrial uh, IoT. But the, the the fourth industrial revolution, unlike the industry 4.0, you know, not is not just limited, you know, to manufacturing or uh, or production, you know, type of uh, problems. The, uh, some people define it as it integrates, you know, different, you know, different worlds: um, uh, physical, digital, uh, biological, and maybe some other, you know, other things. Um, and um, uh, and this, uh, you know, digital transformation, if one looks at it, you know, just from uh, 2018, there was about a $1 trillion that was invested, you know, the, uh, and, and also between 20, 2020 and 2023, uh, the estimate was about uh, almost $7 trillion to be invested, mostly led by, uh, you know, manufacturing uh, industries. Of course, all of this was, you know, for competitiveness, uh, productivity, efficiency, uh, quality, safety, uh, planning and decision making. So uh, this is why I think in these uh, um, uh, manufacturing uh, environments, you know, have been uh, of this type. Um, and then um, uh, uh, you mentioned about the uh, uh, most exciting uh, 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 things. Um, mm -hmm. So, in in my case, I can look at them from two points of views. You know, uh, one is it like from the maybe the technology side, uh, like you know, additive manufacturing, digital twins, uh, robots or collaborative robots, and machine learning and computing in general. Um, uh, also, you know, some work that I've done with uh, with different companies, for example, if you look at the like the triple uh, triple seven, uh, the Boeing triple seven wings, you know, th this is spans like about 70 meters. But when you look at them, you know, these are huge, large, you know, composite uh, structures uh, and uh, uh, Boeing in its facilities, you know, they use uh, advanced robotics instrumentation. And then they combine with all this technology, you know, uh, Boeing's experts, you know, for um, to make like the uh, I see it as a as a unifying team, like people and then technologies. It's just amazing, you know, to see these uh, huge, you know, structures being, you know, uh, uh, made, uh, you know, in in these uh, environments. So so this is like from the technology side. Uh, the other thing is what impressed me most um, is um, the coordination of technology, people, uh, subcontractors, production lines, you know, and you name it, you know, when you look at uh, 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 automotive industry, for example, or uh, uh, airline, excuse me, um, uh, 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 airplane companies uh, and so on, what, what you see 
or at least what I saw things that are maybe, you know, I can't, you can't imagine mind blowing. I give you a couple of examples. So if you, um, in January, I was at uh, Nissan, uh, you know, uh, uh, in actually just where you are, like in mm -hmm. uh, Nashville, right? This is where they make the, like the Rogue, the Murano, Pathfinder and so on. So those, they, they make like about one vehicle per minute. Oh, wow. One vehicle per minute, right? And then if you look at the uh, Boeing, for example, as a, as a, uh, uh, an uh, airplane company, you know, for the, for the 737 that they have like several models, they make about two planes per day, almost, you know, two plane per day. And then the other thing that is maybe mind blowing, this uh, company in China, you know, first uh, uh, auto, auto, uh, automobile works, these are like one of the uh, biggest car companies in China. So they make these di diesel engines, huge diesel engines. These are like the 12 liter and 16 liter engines mm -hmm. that you use like in, in semi and so on. So in, the, in that plant, highly automated, right? One engine per 100 seconds. <laughs> like about a hundred seconds. Can you wow. imagine? <laughs> you know, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these things. Now, when you look at this, it's not just technology, right? It's it's many things that come into play, and how one can, uh, you know, organize, you know, all of these things, you know, to um, uh, to make, um, you know, these uh, assembly uh, uh, factories or uh, 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 and making these. Uh, uh, very complicated uh, systems like a car or like an airplane and then you can you know get everything in place just amazing yeah um, yeah wow um, yeah what i think you had something else in your i have one i have me. one more but before we we go to that point yeah. um i think it's worth mentioning at this point that um yeah, increasing productivity, obviously you save time, you, you save cost, you can invest the money somewhere else. And I have been recently working in automated construction and that is basically my pitch decks. Like, all right, you know, if you let me automate this process, then it's going to be faster, safer, and you're going to save you money. But then one of the immediate questions that I have is, um, how is the effect on, on people? Because now if I have a machine that can do the job of three people, what's going to happen with them? And I think it's a fair question of people asking me, and, and I would like yeah. to know your comments on that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Brian, a great question. So uh, I, I could tell you this, you know, in, in many of the, the companies that, uh, you know, I've uh, visited and worked with, you know, in many countries, uh, you know, uh, um, so, uh, when uh, I ask about the labor, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the answer is almost the same, whether it's in Europe or uh, Asia, Southeast Asia is always the same. The answer is that, you know, uh, they don't have enough people, right? So even in China, you visit these companies, whether it's in the food industry, automotive, uh, energy, you know, you name it. You know, I ask the same question. The answer is the same. You know, we don't have enough people. Why? So first, the uh, today, a lot of the young people are very well educated, you know, uh, everywhere you go or most places, right? So with the bachelor's degrees, master's, you know, PhDs. And so uh, a lot of those people cannot, they don't match, you know, with working on the, on the factory floor. Uh, so that's one thing. The other one, a lot of uh, governments, you know, have invested, you know, a lot in, um, you know, uh, innovation, entrepreneurships, and so on, so that the number of companies, you know, uh, you know, increased to some uh, to some extent. So that means, um, in the end, the pool of people that are available, you know, to do uh, some uh, some types of jobs, you know, is very very uh, limited. The other thing, you know, to what you uh, said about the productivity, the speed, the precision. And the quality, you know, the uh, customers, whether they are individuals or companies or, or organizations, you know, every day their expectations are going higher and higher. And so to, to kind of meet all of this combination of things, you know, you need to have, you know, uh, robotics, automation, this kind. Of, and then people can be trained, you know, to work on, uh, uh, you know, other, uh, other type of things. 
Great. That are yeah, maybe I, less, yeah, less, uh, maybe less hazardous, less, uh, less complex. For example, like in, uh, in, uh, in uh, at Amazon, right? So, uh, you know, when they started, you know, they had many people, you know, working, you know, uh, to fulfill, you know, these orders. They go in the lines, and and then some of them, you know, walked. I don't know. To the, 20 miles or so, like a day, you know, I think this person has to be very fit. So today they have all robots doing that. And then the people are doing something, you know, something else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, your point is is great. Yeah, I think I've, my experience has been similar on labor shortage and just people are not keen to do hard labor. Even if there is some jobs like that, the turnover rate is super high. So yeah, yeah. it will be good to have that, those automated processes. So on that train of thought, um, how do you see control engineers playing a role in, in the continuous growth of this uh, industry 4.0? Yeah, well, I think uh, control engineers, uh, I, I think play uh, like a critical role, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in industries, you know, in general, and, and especially for the, uh, you know, uh, what we're calling industry 4.0, uh, or the more general, you know, the fourth uh, in, uh, industrial uh, revolution. Uh, I mean, control engineers do many things, you know, like designing, implementing, you know, feedback control systems. Uh, you know, this is to um, uh, uh, like integrate uh, subsystems and components, you know, in these automated systems, you know, including all of the instrumentation and controls. Um, uh, and, and of course, all of this, would be to achieve like high level of precision, as we just talked earlier, precision and reliability and efficiency. Uh, and so um, uh, one is designing and implementing these control systems, the algorithms that go with them, right? And so the algorithms for uh, learning, uh, uh, perhaps in, in either offline or in real time, the, the monitoring, um, prediction, uh, and most importantly, the adaptation to changes, real-time changes, uh, uh, rapid changes, particularly unpredictable disturbances and how to recover from those. The things that happen all the time or in a repeated way, you know, those, you know, we can learn, uh, but there are sometimes a one-off things that happen, right? And then how do, how do, uh, does a machine or a process, you know, deal with that, you know, uh, very quickly? And recovers, you know, from the effect of that. Um, and of course, you know, all of this uh, is in the area of control uh, systems or control engineers that they uh, that contribute, uh, you know, to these uh, uh, to these areas. Great, yeah, great, great comments. So, um, for our younger audience, those are students who are just starting their their careers on, or maybe trying to pursue a career in, in control. So they are, uh, they, if they might be interested in pursuing um, industrial automation, by, but maybe they may not know where to start. So what mm -hmm. advice do you have for students who want to learn more about this field and potentially get involved in it? Yeah. Yeah, so as I, uh, you know, we just mentioned, you know, that the uh, robotics, uh, robotics automation, industrial automation, uh, you know, that, um, you know, play uh, an important role in many, many, uh, you know, fields. Uh, and so um, uh, these advanced uh, technologies that include robots, uh, instrumentation, uh, 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 PLCs, you know, from the industry side, uh, software, um, uh, control systems, um, uh, processes and, and machines. Um, and so, so, these, so these are, you know, all of the um, like what usually these uh, uh, applications uh, uh, involve. Uh, so, but for, uh, you know, our maybe young students, I'd like to emphasize that today, you know, I think we need a, a, a like a solid uh, foundation first in, in engineering, mathematics, uh, computer science approaches or methods. Um, uh, this is just to deal with the, uh, you know, uh, complex uh, data, large amounts of data, and then how do do maybe some kind of optimizations, you know, in uh, in this. So, and also in addition to that, uh, Brian, uh, uh, programs that that include the practical and experimental aspect, uh, 
I think that that is, uh, uh, I must say that here at MIT and especially, you know, in our McKee department, we emphasize a lot, you know, the hands-on uh, aspects uh, in addition to the analytical and, uh, and theoretical uh, 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 side. Uh, and the other thing is the understanding of physical systems, you know. Uh, you know, the data by itself, I believe that many times is not sufficient, you know, in many engineering systems. Um, and uh, and then for the young, you know, to uh, and for us too, you know, to uh, to stay curious and then to continue to learn, you know, every day, you know, about uh, whether it's industrial automation, um, uh, because these fields, you know, are moving, you know, uh, uh, you know, very, very uh, fast. Uh, so. Anyway, it just reminded me, you know, that uh, when I was doing my undergraduate studies at the University of Cincinnati, uh, I was in mechanical engineering and I wanted to do computer science. And then the, uh, you know, the uh, organization that was uh, providing my fellowship, you know, I, I requested many times, but then they declined. So they said, your fellowship is for McKee, you stay in mechanical, you know, engineering. And then, so now looking back, you know, I'm glad that my request was rejected at that time, even though I was not very happy, you know, but mm -hmm. looking back, I'm glad, you know, that it was rejected and I continu continued in McKee and did actually all of my degrees in mechanical uh, engineering and, and uh, uh, some uh, minor in computer science. And it turned out for me that that was like the best, uh, you know, the best combination because uh, the system that we work with, uh, with different companies, uh, you know, involve different things. And then knowing, you know, the uh, the fundamentals in, in engineering, like for example, mechanics, um, materials, uh, fluid mechanics, uh, thermal uh, thermodynamics, uh, thermal systems, uh, in addition to controls and, and algorithms and, and instrumentation and so on. I think it, it makes a, a, a base, you know, a, a, let's say for someone like a, a solid base, and then they can, you know, uh, work and contribute, you know, to different uh, kinds of applications. Yeah. Yeah. As a mechanical engineer myself, I like that that description and the 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 phrase the jack of all trades that one can basically uh, diverge to any any field. Um, and I and I just want to emphasize the fact that you said. Um, that yet yeah, data is not everything, right? So we can we can throw all the data we want to try to solve a problem, but the engineering intuition of where to look, what sensors to look at, what yes, is important, yes. meaningful features of the system is crucial to solve a problem. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and actually, you know, uh, Brian, in uh, in my consulting work, I think there was probably only once or twice where I was asked to design a control system, a, a, a feedback control system. You know, all of the other cases, it was that the engineers at the company did everything. They did the design, they implemented, they did the instrumentation, the controls, they did everything, but then in the end doesn't work. Okay, so then the question there is why it doesn't work, why it does not meet, you know, the specifications or why it does not, you know, respond the way it's supposed to, right? Why does it have these other peculiar things that are not, you know, uh, obvious? And then in that case, you know, one has to look at everything, you know, maybe vibration that is coming from the ground. Um, Somebody maybe if these are nano systems, maybe somebody is too close to the equipment and breathing on it, and it is expanding, and you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, missing you know the performance. So uh, yeah, so I I agree that it uh, you know having, I think this uh, uh, solid base, and then being able to handle you know the, the, these complicated you know situations. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, great, great comments, great suggestions. So um, as we wrap up, let's let's end on a fun note. So if you had the opportunity to travel forward in time and witness the next major industrial revolution, how many years into the future would you go and why? Okay, travel forward in the in the in the future. 
Yeah, basically, when do, when do you think the next industrial revolution is going to happen? Yeah. And, and why? Why will be the triggering factor of the next? Mm. Yeah, traveling in time first. You know, that, yeah, wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, we can go back and forth. I mean, yeah, this is, uh, you know, uh, you know, you, we can see like these um, uh, past, you know, industrial uh, revolutions. So the first one, uh, you know, lasted like about maybe 100 years, um, you know, ending like around maybe 1840 or so. And then the second industrial revolutions maybe lasted about 50 years after that. Uh, so uh, maybe ending like around uh, uh, like the early 19, 1900s, like 1915, 1920 maybe. Um, and then the third one uh, started like in the, maybe you, you could say like the late 70s uh, till today. So these are like about maybe 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the fourth, uh, perhaps you could say it, it started maybe the late 2000 uh, till today. So that's like only 20 years. So things are like moving, you know, very, very fast, you know, from the technology point of view. And I would say also from conflicts, you know, point of view, you know, conflicts between not only between companies, but maybe more between countries, you know, mm -hmm. and making things maybe more, more uh, complicated. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, you know, people talk about convergence, you know, in many different uh, areas, uh, particularly, you know, the digital, the AI, uh, the biological, physical technologies. Um, and all of these, you know, uh, leading to perhaps say uh, uh, different forms of or, or new forms of how uh, humans are interacting with machines or collaborating with the machine or even maybe humans uh, uh, interfacing, you know, uh, physically, you know, with, uh, with machines and advanced robotics, personalized medicine. Um, so if we think about this, it seems to me that uh, quite a few of these things are happening now, right, uh, already. And so then I would not call this uh, Industry 5.0 or the fifth industrial uh, revolution. Um, uh, the other thing is maybe fi fi thinking like ahead, I don't know, 50 years or 100 years in the future. Uh, because things are moving so fast and going in in, in unpredictable directions, uh, maybe it's not wise for me to try to predict that. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Brian, assuming that um, we will by that time that we will still have a planet Earth, <laughs> you know, uh, we yeah. we have yeah we have been messing up this planet, you know, uh, left and right for some time. You know, and more recently, I think in an acceler accelerated way, right? And so, uh, and adding in addition to this, uh, you know, uh, greed, you know, greed for money, greed for fame, uh, greed to do anything, you know, and fast. Um, and so, uh, it makes it for me, uh, you know, difficult to, uh, to you know, to do that. Uh, uh, I, if you don't mind, you know, I, I met, you know, uh, 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 our, um, you know, cosmonaut, uh, cosmonaut, not kind of an astronaut, cosmonaut is in some other place. <laughs> um, uh, astronaut, uh, you know, Alan Bean, you know, who, uh, who, who walked on the moon. This was in, wow. in, in Houston, uh, Texas, you know, at an event uh, that uh, Schlumberger Company had uh, put together uh, a few years back. And, uh, and he mentioned then that when he, when he was on the moon, Right, and he was looking at Earth the way we look, you know, at the moon. He said that he could not wait, you know, to come back to Earth very quickly. He said because on the moon, the only thing that kept him alive was the suit that he was wearing, and there is nothing there. There's only dust, right, and rocks, and that's it. And he said, as far as we know, there is no other planet, you know, around, you know, that has what Earth has. Right. So, yeah. So then he said, you know, when he came back to Earth, so then, you know, he said he started appreciating everything, 
you know, like the leaves on a tree, uh, like you see, like a, a little dog. He said he would go to the to the um, uh, like a mall and just see people, you know, walking around. He said, I just came from a place where there's nothing, you know, there's not even <laughs> air to breathe, you know. Right. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, so that, yeah, that, uh, you know, the, what he said and the way he said it, you know, uh, you know, is still, you know, in my mind, you know, since, uh, you know, since then, you know, so many years later. Uh, but for this uh, question, uh, Brian, I'd like to take uh, Margaret Mead's stand on this. Okay, and Margaret Mead was uh, an American uh, uh, cultural, you know, anthropologist. You know, she passed away like in the mid 70s. Um, and uh, she emphasized, you know, civilization, civilization or a great civilization where people, you know, help, you know, help each other, right? Whether we are in the same country or, or in a different country, we have only one planet, you know, and how we can help each other, you know, to, uh, to live in a harmonious, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, environment uh, as a whole. And that's what I would like to uh, answer you. I, I know that I am uh, not answering your question, but this is what uh, is coming to my mind at this time, uh, Brian. Yeah, the messaging is the important part, right? Uh, not only that we are all on the same boat, but also that we should all be working together. And I think that has been the mission of, of many people and institutions I've, I've talked to of like, yeah, we have this massive problem of climate change and, and other ones looming around us and and yeah the question is what are we doing about it and, and there is yes, some yes. good work out there and, and a lot of work and long hours to try to solve this pressing problem so there is hope but also it's, it's a good to take a moment of appreciation of what we have now yes yeah, yeah. great well um thanks again this has been an, an awesome interview I, i've enjoyed a lot talking to you um i'm sure that our audiences are going to appreciate all your comments and, and all your, your wisdom on this. So, so thank you very much, Kamal. That was a thank pleasure you, to talk to you. Brian, that, thank you and thank the team on my behalf uh, for giving me the opportunity to be with you. And I hope that we'll uh, get to see you guys in person uh, sometime soon. Thank you.